Good afternoon, and thank you for your time. I, I appreciate the time that uh, you're giving me as we go through this study of the most important concept that we find in Scripture, and that is grace. The word grace makes us think of, of wonderful hope and comfort. It's a word the Apostle Paul loved to use. As he wrote the New Testament, as he wrote these letters and sent out to the various churches that he had helped establish and, and, and was, was encouraging them and teaching them, he, he would often begin his letters uh, gr asking for God's grace to be upon the ones that were reading. And, and he often ended his letters by talking about grace. But not just the beginning and the ending of his letters. So many of the passages <clears throat> throughout the New Testament Paul talked about grace, what grace was, and most importantly, how we could come into contact with God's grace. And so, unfortunately, this, this word grace, this concept, is so often misunderstood by people and misapplied. And so it's important that we do know what grace is and how we can come into contact with God's grace. Well, let's begin this lesson by talking about what grace is. Let's, let's define it a little bit. The most common definition that you hear out there when somebody says, what is grace, is unmerited favor. Somebody came up with that concept. It's not words that are necessarily found in the Bible. The principle is there. It is certainly unmerited favor. It means that God blesses us in ways that we have not, do not, or will ever deserve or be able to earn. So it's unmerited favor. We don't deserve it, but God grants it. Someone else described grace as blessings bestowed when wrath was owed. This goes a bit further in describing grace by showing that not only is the favor or the blessing not deserved, but they have been given when what was deserved was God's punishment. Now that's a key element of the concept of grace, and we'll, we'll come back to that uh, as we go through the lesson. And yet another way to describe grace is, is with the, the letters G-R-A-C-E that form the word grace. If you look at each one of these letters, somebody came up with this statement, God's riches at Christ's expense or G-R-A-C-E, and it helps us remember uh, the concept of grace. But this means that the blessings we receive from God were given at the cost of Jesus' life. Now, do you see here what grace is through each one of these? It's unmerited favor. It's given to us by God when we did not deserve it or do not deserve it. The second part is that Instead of giving us grace, what was really due us was punishment or the wrath of God because of our disobedience. And yet it is not free. It cost, cost dearly. It cost the life of Jesus. So it's something we don't deserve, yet it's given to us and we're not given punishment, but it also costs something, the life of Jesus. Grace is, is at the core or the very center of God's plan. It, 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 it's, it's granted to us the first time in the Garden of Eden when, when Adam and Eve disobeyed God, the willful disobedience uh, that they participated in when, when Eve took of that fruit of the uh, tree of knowledge of good and evil, gave it to Adam, and he took of it as well. That when Satan deceived them in this, and instead of, of destroying man because of his willful disobedience or rebellion and, and starting over, God, because of his love for us, made a way for man to come back to him. That's through Jesus. And when you read Genesis chapter 3, you see where God put that plan into action. God did not have to do this. But he did it because of his love for us, his love for Adam and Eve, his love for mankind, his love for you and I. And so what was first uh, time of granting God's grace? It was not the last time that God showed us grace, because all throughout 
humanity's history that we have rebelled against God, and yet God still holds out that opportunity for us to come back to him. Somebody once asked me, why doesn't God bring about judgment? Why is he waiting so long to bring about judgment? And, and it makes me think that perhaps there's just one more sinner that, that God is waiting to come back to him. One more opportunity. And perhaps that's you. And if it is, think about that. God's waiting for you to come back. That's grace. All right, I'll, I want to read if you will turn with me to Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9 and and it, it it really talks about grace and it is is one of those verses that sadly is so misunderstood or, or so misapplied by people that it it really um, interferes with our understanding of grace and and so that's why it's such a critical verse we we have to understand it it says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one can boast. And as you read that verse and, and think about that verse, there's some things that come out. We're saved by grace. It, it's not anything that I've done to earn it. It's a gift of God. It, it's not boasting. And in fact, it should be humbling. should have the opposite effect of boasting. I didn't deserve it, but God's giving it to me. Now, as wonderful a concept as grace is, again, it's so misunderstood, and, 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 and unfortunately, it's most misunderstood when applied to our salvation. Certainly, without grace, there would be no salvation. But many of us have difficulty not only understanding grace, but in accepting grace, many feel that they, they just have to do something to earn it. And so what I want to do is I want to look at the relationship between grace and salvation and works, because the three are joined together. So let's take a look at that now. As I said earlier, grace is at the heart of our relationship with God. It's at the core of our salvation. God gives it to us, knowing that we cannot earn it nor deserve it. So salvation through grace is a basic teaching of the Bible. And in fact, our Christianity, our, our mankind salvation is based on grace. There is no way we can become Christ-like if it were not for grace. Now, it's interesting as you look at the religions that man has made, the world religions or the denominational teachings that are out there, the religions of the world, they're based on uh, spending a life trying somehow to be good enough or to do enough to somehow try to earn God's favor. And part of the problem is that man-made or man-based religions are flawed from the beginning and flawed in their outcome because God did not create them. Now, grace does make demands on us. Grace demands an obedient faith. That means doing what God wants us to do. And what he wants us to do is to become Christ's life. In Acts chapter 2, after Peter preached the first gospel sermon, the people hearing it cried out to him, asking what they needed to do to escape God's punishment. Peter told them to show obedience by their repentance and baptism. In other words, they had to obey God's will. The same is true for us. Since the New Testament had not been written yet when Paul made those, or excuse me, Peter made those that wonderful statement, what Peter and the other apostles taught was what God wants us to do. That became what we now have as the New Testament. And it starts in Acts, there in Acts 2. As, as Peter stated those wonderful words, and then it goes through the rest of the New Testament, as I said, as Paul's teachings and, and Peter and John and James, the others. A wise man once made a great statement. He said, we work because of our faith, not for it. We work because of our faith, not for it. Our, our faith or our belief, our trust in God should cause us to want to do what God wants us to do, not something we do 
to earn it. Obedience does not earn salvation. Obedience puts us into that relationship with God, but it does not earn it. It's already been paid. The idea of earning salvation means we somehow can work hard enough to earn forgiveness of our sins. Yet, it's not only impossible, it's unnecessary, because it's already been paid on the cross by Jesus. I'd like you to also turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 17, verses 7 through 10. There's a wonderful statement that Jesus makes in here. He says, So you also, when you have done all that were, were, was commanded, say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done what was our duty. In other words, we don't earn it. It is a duty that we have. We work because of our faith, not for it. Not for it. Jesus gives us a wonderful example of grace in one of his greatest parables, the prodigal son. So let's look at it. You'll find it in Luke chapter 15. Uh, verses 11 through 32. This great parable, the prodigal son, is actually one of three parables that he gives. And and although although grace is not necessarily the primary message of of these great parables, it is necessary. It is, however, an an integral part of those parables. But the parable of the prodigal son, it, it, this great story is about how God welcomes home a sinner who has repented. That's the primary message. There's, there's complete rejection of the family and the morals and the values of the family, just a total rejection of the family by, by this prodigal son. But then the son comes to his senses, as, as the story states, and there's complete repentance on the part of the son, and he turns from that foreign land that he's in and he returns back to the father and then there's complete forgiveness by the father which by the way jesus is teaching this great parable and it's so consistent with the teachings that jesus taught us in so many other places beginning first of all with with the beatitudes in in Matthew chapter 5 verse 34 Jesus talks about being poor in spirit that that, that theirs would be the kingdom of heaven that poor in spirit means humility and repentance and turning back to God and accepting grace certainly involves repentance and and humility and then 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 the next verse there in, in Matthew uh, chapter 5 verse 4 he talks about blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted well the prodigal son was certainly sorrowful for his condition and wanted to return to the father where he knew he had a better life and 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 that's what the mourning is talking about that it's mourning for our sins which leads us to repentance so this this wonderful parable truly shows God's grace through the actions of the father. Some people would agree with the older son who demanded justice for the younger son's wasteful life. Some might require mercy by saying that the, the father should demand that the young son work as a servant until he paid back what he had wasted. But God, as shown in the story of by the, the father, he, he, he grants grace by forgiving the son and and so that's what god does he he forgives the sinner that turns back to him without reservation without making demands that's what god offers us when we realize our sin and turn to him he accepts us back he restores us into the family and when you think about it you look at it what is grace and how does it roll out of the prodigal son Justice, that means giving me what I deserve. I sinned, I deserve justice. But then there's mercy. That's, that's not giving me what I deserve. But in the story and what God does, he goes even further with grace. He gives me what I do not deserve. Justice says give that sinner what he deserves. But mercy is you deserve it, but I'm not going to give it. God goes one step further 
not only not only does he not punish but he gives us his grace he rewards us for turning back to him and as you read through the parable of the prodigal son that was the exact opposite of what the older son who stayed home and remained there his his reaction he demanded justice not even mercy or grace and 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 God tells in this story that that he is granting us the complete opposite of that. That's what grace is, and that's why God loves us so much. Another element of this I want to show with this diagram. This diagram, what I'm trying to show in, in, in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, the final recorded words we have of, of the Apostle Peter, this, this, this man who started out his, his uh, life uh, following Jesus as such a firebrand, somebody who was, had such a hot temper and was often saying the wrong thing at the wrong time and just full of himself, really. But then at the end of the New Testament, as he's, he, we have his last recorded words, he says, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory. What a, what a wonderful change of heart Peter had. And so what I've tried to show in this diagram, if you'll look on, on the right side of the diagram, you, you see that it's all, I'm sorry, on the left side of the diagram, it's all of self. But as we grow in grace and knowledge of Jesus, it becomes less and less of self and more and more of Christ until eventually self is completely lost in Christ. And when they see us, they see Christ. We go, it's less and less of self and more and more Christ-like. We, we grow in grace by becoming more Christ-like. And, and, and the qualities that, that Christ exemplified, humility, obedience, and glorifying our Lord, our, our, our God. So when we understand what grace is, we praise God for his love for us. It, it, it causes us to want to do what God asks us to do. He first asks us to return to him, if for the first time, to become in Christ through our belief, our repentance, and our baptism. It, it, if it is as the prodigal son did, it means to confess our sins, to repent and return to God return to the family we were once a part of. The promise of the story of the prodigal son is that God will welcome us back with loving and open arms. Grace is the greatest news of all. Jesus completed the greatest act of grace by dying for us so that we can have our greatest need met, the need for forgiveness of sin and to be joined back with God. Thank you.